Hello from Israel. This is Carolyn Glick. I'm Carolyn Glick, and this is the Carolyn Glick Middle East News Hour. I'm joined, as usual, with my by my co-host, uh, Gadi Tab. Hi, Gadi. Hi from Tel Aviv, Caroline. Good to see you. Good to see you too. As we speak today, Israel is uh, is under under attack. Today, uh, in the space of five minutes, the city of Ashkelon in Israel absorbed 137 separate missile attacks from Gaza, uh, which is controlled by the Hamas uh, terrorist organization. Two women were killed uh, during these attacks when uh, their apartment building and their, their, their apartment absorbed a direct hit by a missile. Um, and uh, the rioting is going on throughout uh, Israel in mixed Arab, Israeli, Jewish uh, cities and in Jerusalem. And uh, we're here today uh, to talk about what's happening on the ground and also, and more importantly, from our perspective, what's causing it, what is fueling these attacks and what role is the Biden administration playing uh, in the violence that's now plaguing Israel, where we see not only that the Palestinians from the Fatah led Palestinian Authority in Judea and Samaria in the West Bank, headquartered in, in the town of Ramallah, is inciting and involved in the attacks and Hamas, the terrorist organization allied or controlled by Iran that controls Gaza, is fueling the is fueling the attacks and pushing all of the missiles out and largely inciting the uh, mobs, but also Israeli Arab citizens. Israel has a, an Arab minority of uh, something between uh, 18 and 20 percent, and they too are actively involved in these riots, which casts a pall over Jewish-Arab relations in this country uh, uh, that we haven't really seen since uh, the Israeli Arabs conducted a pogrom against Israeli Jews in October of 2000. So all of this is happening now. Um, schools in southern Israel were closed today, luckily, because a school in Ashkelon absorbed a direct hit. Uh, and uh, also in uh, the Tel Aviv area, Gadi can tell us what's going on there, but uh, the area was placed under the control of the IDF's Home Front Command, and uh, the announcement yesterday was that they were limiting public gathering to 30 people. They ordered the opening of all uh, uh, of all public uh, bomb shelters. Um, so we're in, uh, since we met last week, uh, we've been plunged into war. Um, you know, we were talking last week about the political situation and whether Israel was going to get a left-wing government that was controlled by uh, the right wing or led uh, by uh, uh, a puppet from uh, the head of the Yamina, uh, supposedly ideologically uh, right-wing uh, coalition. But because that coalition government that was about to be formed really last night, they were supposed to present their government to President uh, Reuben Rivlin, uh, and and convene it uh, on a confidence vote in the Knesset to to uh, to bring in this new government. I'm not sure. I'm not sure they really they were really ready yet. There there are still okay. So those were the reports. So yeah. all of that stalled out because the Arab partner. There are two Arab parties in in Israel. One is the Joint Arab List, and the other one is the uh, is the uh, Ram Party, uh, which you know by its English name is what Gadi. Uh, the United, uh, not the United, the the, the United Arab Party. Is I think so. So that yeah, no, it's, it's it's a party that's a that's an, okay. Yeah. So that the joint the United Arab List. So the United Arab List is led by a man named uh, named um, Abbas, and uh, he was offering himself as a coalition partner to both sides of the political spectrum, to the Likud-led right-wing bloc and to the left-wing bloc that is being uh, formally headed uh, by uh, the right-wing politician uh, Naftali Bennett and his Yamina party. And so he offered to join both coalitions. Uh, the uh, left-wing uh, coalition that was set to be formed was supposed to be relying on him. But then uh, when the rioting really began in uh, or, or escalated to new highs yesterday with uh, Hamas shooting rockets at Jerusalem, uh, he, he said that he wouldn't uh, join any coalition uh, and he sided with the Palestinians against Israel. Which only goes to show, uh, uh, my, father used to, my, my father used to say, I, I, I don't like to say I told you so, but I will, but I will, but I will. And, the pro and, and God forbid if, if Netanyahu had, had uh, uh, formed a government based on them and we had this now because they said, the, 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 at least according to the, the tweets, they said that they uh, under no conditions will they support any war in Gaza. So imagine any government leaning on them is 
is saying in advance that we will not protect our southern front despite the constant barrage uh, of, of uh, uh, rockets. I mean, constant. It's not as uh, serious now, but there's always a drip. Right. So for our purposes, the reason why this is important uh, just for our hour together today, because we're not going to talk about the political situation, is that it enables us not to talk about the political situation because we don't know what's going to happen. Uh, the left wing bloc has another, I think, three weeks to the time that it's been allotted to put together a government. So, uh, you know, perhaps uh, the guns will uh, stop firing. The Palestinian guns will stop firing. We'll get a ceasefire and they'll try to put together one in a, in a week or two. Um, but for now, for this week, uh, the political situ is situation has been placed on hold, and that allows us to devote our hour to this. But I will say, God is right. He did tell me so. You know, I had been, like many Israelis, uh, hoping that uh, the uh, that the uh, United Arab List was. Um, <laughs> United, was yeah, was a, yeah was was an was a domestic Israeli Arab uh, reflection or or expression of the spirit of the Abraham Accords, the peace accords that Israel signed with the UAE, Morocco, Sudan, and Bahrain uh, in the in the late uh, later months of the Trump administration. Um, so I was hopeful that this was actually um, you know an expression of that because Israeli Arabs um, by, you know were were very supportive of those deals. Um, so that was what I was hoping, but uh, unfortunately, hope is not a policy, and uh, and uh, this has been proven um, by uh, by the uh, by this uh, Arab party's behavior. Uh, joining uh, there are two Arab uh, Islamic, the, it, two Israeli Islamic movements. The South one, which was always considered more moderate, which is led by the head of uh, the United Arab List, and the Northern one, which is led by a man named Raid Saleh, who was even barred from the UK because he's such an extreme jihadist. Um, so these two uh, warring so-called factions of the moderate on the one hand and, and the uh, extremists on the other hand uh, have joined together, fused uh, uh, today, uh, and there's really no distinction between them, and uh, it's a tragedy. I will make one one political comment before we go to, to the discussing the international uh, arena, and, and that is that that my fear is that since Netanyahu gave them a modicum of legitimacy, he will now make it easier for Naftali Bennett. And if he had not, now Naftali Bennett would not be able to return to any uh, deal with, with Ram. I'm, I'm still afraid he will be able to say, well, you know, Netanyahu also would have done it. So I think I, it'll I be much more be. difficult. I think it'll be much more difficult in the time frame that's uh, still uh, been allotted to to Yair Lapid, the head of the left wing bloc, uh, to form a government uh, for them to do that because uh, the violence is just too severe. And so I just want to, you know, back up for a second and talk about how we got here because I think that's really, you know, uh, people can uh, watch uh, updates from uh, IsraelIom.com or from Ynet.com or for the the JPost.com to get the play-by-play -play of what's happening at every moment. Uh, but I think that what what our value added here is to explain how we got here and what what the implications are for the future of what's happening today. And so, um, so I just want to back up. You know, there were there were a couple of I'm writing an article about this now for Newsweek, and um, that should come out later this week. But there were uh, the, these these attacks, which have involved uh, attempted lynchings by Palestinian and Arab mobs of Jewish uh, bystanders or passersby uh, in various neighborhoods in Jerusalem, and last night in the mixed Jewish-Israeli town of Ramle, and in other spots in this country, uh, in the Galilee, uh, when a Jewish motorist uh, accidentally entered into a, an Arab village in the in in the Galilee where they were rioting. Um, you know, these these attacks didn't come out of nowhere, and they certainly weren't a response to something that Israel did. They are a direct response of Palestinian incitement, uh, the incitement to violence, first in Jerusalem and then using Jerusalem as a focal point for a larger Palestinian and Arab Israeli offensive against Israel began over a month ago, it began before the holy month of Ramadan, the holy Muslim month of Ramadan that is ending this on Wednesday of this week. Um, and really this month of Ramadan in the region, in Israel and the Palestinian areas, uh, has been particularly bloody. And again, this is all a result of incitement. So the PA, Fatah-led PA, 
uh, began the incitement uh, in early April already because uh, they were trying to deflect Palestinian public attention away from something that uh, PA leader Mahmoud Abbas was doing. And what was he was doing was after you know he succumbed so-called to pressure, to public pressure to finally have elections. He was elected in 2005 to serve a four-year term as the Palestinian Authority president, and he has not been re-elected since. So he's now in the 16th year of his four-year term. The Palestinian legislature Council held elections in January of 2006. The Hamas won a majority of the seats in that council. And since then as well, they haven't had more, they haven't had new legislative elections. And the reason for that is clear because all of the Palestinian opinion polls show that Hamas is more powerful among not only Palestinian residents of Gaza, which is ruled by the Hamas terrorist organization, but also among Palestinians who live in Judea and Samaria, which is under the uh, control of the Palestinian Authority of Fatah. So Abbas has been avoiding elections all along, and each time that there's been a pressure, or in this case, an actual move to schedule elections, which were supposed to be held, the legislative elections were supposed to be held this month in May, and then the second round of presidential elections were supposed to be held, I believe, in July. Um, he knew this was all a head fake from the very beginning. He did it in order to show that he was listening to the public. But then from the outset, he was trying to build a case for canceling those elections by blaming Israel, saying that Israel wasn't going to allow Jerusalem residents, Arab Jerusalem residents to vote. And what, what Israel wasn't allowing him to do was set up polling stations in its capital city. But Jerusalem Arab voted, uh, residents could have voted in the Palestinian election either by going into Palestinian authority controlled areas, or as the European Union suggested, they could have done it online. And Abbas didn't want that. So this isn't about voting rights. This is about trying to undermine Israel's control of its capital city by for trying to coerce it through international pressure to allow polling booths to open in Jerusalem. You know, Caroline, it, it, be, be, before you go on, just to, to, to tell you about how uh, my journey from the left to the right had to do exactly with this with this balance of power within the Palestinian Authority, because I was in some um, in some conference uh, some years ago, and it's a, one of those places where Arabs and Israelis meet, and so it's secret. And and I used to smoke back then, so so I got the most in, because it's only only me and the Arabs would smoke, so Westerners don't anymore. So I got the best gossip because in the smokers' corner was the most interesting talk, and I stood with a Palestinian activist there, um, who, a, a human rights activist, by the way, a pro-Israeli one who thinks the. Palestinian Authority is a violator of human rights. And and he said, you Israelis, on the left, he meant, you always talk about ending the occupation. Why do you think we'll let you leave? And I was then on the left, and I said, what do you mean? You don't want the occupation to end? He said, who's going to protect us? So these people, these, these Fatah people, their great fear is... Hamas, they're right not to make, to make elections because we know what happened after the elections in Gaza. They took the Fatah people, they blindfolded them and threw them off buildings. So, so th these Fatah uh, uh, people, and this is also the reason why there is no chance that they will agree to any solution of partition because any deal that would leave them to be swallowed up by Hamas, they can't take. So obviously he can't have elections. And, he, and Mahmoud Abbas, his whole strategic game is to have it both ways. Ways. He will have the occupation protecting him from Hamas, and he will have the victim status as a victim of the occupation to complain to the international community and to get money, which he would then give to, to terrorists. So just for you know, for the, the broader picture for our listeners uh, abroad, this is this is a trap. This is a, it, there's no way of cutting this Gordian knot. I agree with you, and I think and I think that that's an important insight. It is true that uh, you know Israel protects Fatah, and then Fatah uh, is able to keep its legitimacy, which it actually doesn't have, because again, it has never been in a position six, since two thousand and five, really, or two thousand and six, to win elections in the Palestinian areas, because the Palestinians don't support Fatah. They know how corrupt it is. They know. Uh, and and as far as their concern as a mobilized society, they prefer Hamas's open message of annihilation of Israel uh, over uh, over Fatah's message of let's annihilate Israel uh, through deception. 
So that's the other thing is that, so what happened was that the Fatah began inciting all of these riots against Israel, uh, saying that Israel was uh, threatening Al-Aqsa, which is what they always say, the Temple Mount, Israel, you know, the, the holiest site of for Judaism, it's the site of the two temples uh, of, the, of the biblical era, the Jewish temples, and it's also uh, the third holiest site to Islam. Um, so every time that they want to uh, to incite a war, to incite a terrorist rampage against Israelis, against Jews, uh, the Palestinians claim that Israel is endangering Al-Aqsa Mosque. Um, and these these are all blood libels. They've never been true. But that's what they do. This is the playbook and it always works. And um, the other thing that they and then and then Hamas, of course, joined in. And since Hamas is more powerful among uh, the Palestinians and also among the Arabs of Jerusalem, uh, you know, they were able to overwhelm the PA uh, Fatah with their incitement. And so we saw last week, for instance, the Fatah was saying that May 9th, which was a day that conflated uh, Israel's celebration of the unification of Jerusalem in the Six Day War uh, with the holiest day of Ramadan, the day I think that the Prophet Gabriel, according to the Quran, is supposed to have come down and 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 taught the Quran to Muhammad. Um, and then uh, the third day was Iran's El Quds or Jerusalem Day, which is a day that Ayatollah Khomeini invented uh, as a day to mobilize the Arab world to annihilate Israel. So these three days were all supposed to fall on or about May 9th. And Hamas made very clear all of its leaders that on May 9th, they were going to be opening up a massive assault on Israel on Jerusalem first and foremost, and that it was and and the reason that Hamas chose for this and Hamas and Fatah of course agreed was a court case is a uh, a property a property case. So uh, in the Sheikh Jarrah neighborhood, which is a neighborhood an Arab neighborhood in northeast Jerusalem, which used to be a Jerusalem neighborhood because it's where uh, uh, the Prophet uh, uh, Shimon was is is buried. So the Shimon at Sadiq neighborhood. Well, Sheikh Jarrah neighborhood. It used to have a lot of Jews living there until 1948. And uh, in 1875, uh, the Sephardic and Ashkenazic chief rabbis of Jerusalem bought uh, plots of land and built buildings in Sheikh Jarrah neighborhood. Those buildings were seized by Jordanian uh, of military authorities in 1948 after Jordan conquered northern, eastern, and southern Jerusalem. Uh, in their illegal invasion of the nascent state of of, of Israel in the day that it uh, that that then David Ben Gurion de declared independence, so they seized these Jewish-owned buildings in 1948, and then the Jordanian Registrar of Enemy, Enemy Property leased them to Arab tenants in Jerusalem uh, during the Jordanian occupation. The Jordanian occupation of these areas of Jerusalem ended with a Six-Day War in 1967, and in 1973. Uh, the Israeli owners of the building relisted, re-registered their ownership of the buildings in the Israeli land registry. And since then, they've been in a now, you know, 48-year-old, 48-year legal battle with the Palestinian squatters to get them out of their apartment buildings so that they could uh, restore their proprietorship of their private property. Okay. In 1982, there was a court case. This is important. That's why I'm wasting your time with it. It's not a waste of time. 1982, the Palestinian squatters acknowledged that the buildings were owned by the Jews, but they've refused to pay rent and they've refused to leave. Always incited by the PLO and then later by the PLO and by Fatah and by the international community. There are all of these NGOs, the, pa the Sheikh Jarrah Solidarity Union and all sorts of other far left European Union often funded NGOs that are pushing the narrative that the court cases that have all found in favor of the Israeli landowners are an expression of Israeli apartheid, that recognizing and 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 respecting Jewish property rights is illegal or and immoral under international law and under progressive norms because Jews should be denied property rights because they're Jewish in Eastern and Northern and Southern Jerusalem, along with Judea and Samaria. So this is an anti-Semitic position to take because this is a very cut and dried legal case. It's not some arcane Israeli law. It's a law that says that if something belongs to you and illegally, and, and there are illegal squatters who are also not paying you rent, living in them, you have the right to uh, state support and police removing the illegal squatters by force if you have a court order to do so. So all of the courts since 1973 have found in favor of the Israeli uh, building owners. And the case, which was 
which was adjudicated last, again, not for the first time, but by the Jerusalem District Court last year, uh, was appealed every time it's appealed. So it was appealed to the Supreme Court that was supposed to give a final verdict on the issue on May 6th that was later postponed to May 10th, and now it's been postponed indefinitely because of the riots. But Hamas latched on to this as a justification for lighting the match of mass violence in Jerusalem and throughout the country and from Gaza and Judea and Samaria against Israeli Jews. So that was a thing, and you had everybody from Ismail Haniya and uh, Khaled Mashal, and then later Hamas terror boss Mohammed Def, who we haven't heard from since 2014, all essentially saying that the war was going, not all, not essentially saying, explicitly saying that there were a mass assault on Israel was going to begin on May 9th. And in the days leading up to it, you had more and more attacks, burning of Jewish owned buildings in Sheikh Jarrah, assaults on Israeli policemen on the Temple Mount, assault against Israeli civilians and policemen uh, in the Damascus Gate outside of the old city, and so on and so forth. So we, we had a massive uptick of violence against Jews in these particular focal points um, in Jerusalem over the past week. And then they rose to a fever pitch uh, yesterday as Jerusalem Day was observed beginning on Sunday night. Monday, Jerusalem Day was observed in Israel, um, you know, uh, and uh, and all hell basically broke loose uh, with the uh, missile assaults, the rocket assaults on Jerusalem from Gaza. Massive, two, over 200 uh, rockets were shot into southern Israel from uh, Gaza between 6 p.m. and 6 a.m., uh, between Sunday and Monday. Um, and again, uh, Arab gangs and mixed Arab and Jewish towns throughout the country uh, just uh, began attacking Jews and uh, burning synagogues, burning schools, burning Jewish apartments and attempting to lynch Jews. But, but isn't it amazing, Carolyn, that, that this, is, this was initiated in order to, to divert attention from the postponement of the elections. And yet, once it started, Hamas are cooperating in the same um, attempt to light up the region with Fatah. Well, I think that it's not it's not surprising because I mean for two reasons. One is they always cooperate when it comes to attacking Jews. We had the popular resistance committees were formed between Fatah, Hamas, and the Palestinian Islamic Jihad in 2000 to carry out joint operation against Israeli Jews during the Palestinian terror war that lasted more or less from 2000 until 2004 when Israeli forces finally quelled it uh, uh, in a major way. So, um, so no, we've seen active uh, cooperation between uh, these rival terrorist groups all along. Uh, in fact, going back to the, the 1990s when uh, the Palestinian Authority was formed in the in the framework of the Oslo Accords. If you remember, uh, Israeli uh, uh, Corporal Nachshon Waxman was uh, kidnapped and then murdered by Hamas in Bir Nabala outside of Ramallah uh, that in 1994. And um, Rabin was the prime, prime minister and defense minister, then Yitzhak Rabin. And you know he was desperate to find uh, this soldier. There was a video that was put out by a news agency in Gaza with, uh, with Nachshon Vaxman looking very frightened. So initially Israel assumed that, they were, that, that he was being held in Gaza because Gaza was under the Palestinian Authority control, under PLO control. And then they realized that he was wearing a sweater. And the thing is, is that uh, a couple months before he was taken, um, this is something that the Israeli media tried to hide. I was in the military at the time, which is why I knew about it, was that Mohammed Def, the guy who just threatened war against Israel, um, made an agreement with uh, Fatah terror boss Mohammed Dahlan, uh through Arif, it was Arafat's idea, which was that Hamas would carry out terrorist attacks but from areas that weren't under Palestinian authority control so that Israel wouldn't be able to blame the Palestinian authority for the attacks. So this, this cooperation has been going on from the outset of the so-called fake peace process between Israel and the PLO. And so it continues apace today. But the other aspect to that is that Fatah and Hamas are always in a competition for who can out-terrorist the other. So for instance, there was a shooting attack yes, last Monday uh, in which a, a Palestinian terrorist conducted a drive-by shooting against three Israeli seminary yeshiva, yeshiva students who were waiting at a, uh, at a bus stop in Northern Samaria. 
and uh, shot all three. All three were were placed, you know, were in, were critically wounded. One of them died of his wounds on Thursday. So it was actually Fatah who claimed responsibility or credit for the attack. The Fatah office in uh, in Nablus uh, put out a poster. Uh, claiming credit for it. So you have a real rivalry between Fatah and Hamas, particularly particularly today after Fatah canceled the elections, but really all the time, who can outviolence the other one? But uh, Because this is the uniting cause, right? Whenever the, Palestinian, the Palestinians need to r- rally around some national goal, that national goal is either killing Jews or um, fighting to annihilate Zionism. So and and this and this is goes this goes to the core, which which you know I I, I keep recommending to my friends this book by uh, um, Adi Schwartz and Inat Wilf, who are both who both come from the left. It's called the War of Return. It's been published in English too, in which they reluctantly say because they were both supportive of the two state solution. Reluctantly they say the Palestinians are not aiming and have never aimed at pal- at pal- at political independence. Unlike, oh, show your book to taking down my book. The Israeli solution may actually be in my on my camera. It's uh, reversed because of the the way that no, no, we work. see it perfectly. You see it properly, okay? Yeah. So the Israeli solution, a one state plan for peace in the middle, is a book that I wrote in 2014, and actually, you know, I go into detail about. Uh, the first, the first part of the book, the part one of the book, is an explanation of why the two-state solution, so-called, that everybody who's everybody, you know, knows is the only way to solve the Palestinian conflict with Israel, um, is is a total lie, and uh, and it can never work because it's based only on false premises, on, and there's nothing about it that's based on the reality on the ground. So you know, you can read their book. Or you can read my book. I got it right all the time. So uh, the the idea being that that the whole of the Palestinian ethos is is it surrounds what they call the right of return, and it's a geographic and not a political thing. What they are dreaming of is. Uh, returning to the villages from which they ran away and some in some cases were expelled and not and and, and th- their ideal is is not a a uh, 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 political independence like it is for uh, the, the Zionist movement because the Zionist movement and Carolyn here too there as you know there's a great controversy within Zionism um Zion, ben Gurion did not conquer the West Bank. And the West Bank, Judea and Samaria, are the heart of the land of Israel. This is the ancient land of Israel. But Zionism settled around the ancient land of Israel because it wanted to avoid large Palestinian populations. And it could do so because in Zionism, the center of gravity of the Zionist ideology is and has always been the ideal of political independence, and it and and in and when necessary, it trumps the um, the the uh, nostalgia for uh, or or the connection to the old land of Israel. You know, I don't want to get into an argument with that about you, but I think that it's important because I I cited in my book Israel's uh, foreign minister during uh, the Camp David summit where. Arafat uh, rejected Palestinian statehood and the two-state solution, came home and ordered his forces to prepare for war against Israel, which they launched in 2000, again, over uh, uh, fake uh, Israeli uh, uh, threats on Al-Aqsa. Um, so it was a na- man by the name of Shlomo ben Ami. And Shlomo ben Ami was one of the heads of peace now. He was a long time leftist political science professor at Tel Aviv University. And the foreign minister for a while. Right. And so during during the Camp David Accords, the, the Camp David uh, summit that failed in two, in July of 2000, he was uh, sort of the, I don't want to say the lead, yeah, he was the lead negotiator for Israel. He had been in the talks leading up to that and then there as well. So after the Palestinians rejected peace and turned to war against Israel, he gave an interview to, uh, to a, a journalist here named... Um, Ari Shavit in uh, the left wing Haaretz newspaper, and he made some stunning revelations there. He said, um, 
that the peace process had been a hoax. In his words, he said, Arafat's concession vis-a-vis -vis Israel at the outset of the peace process was a formal concession. Morally and conceptually, he didn't recognize Israel's right to exist. He doesn't accept the idea of two states for two people. Neither he nor the Palestinian movement accept us. He went on and said, we are in a confrontation with a national movement in which there are serious pathological elements. It is a very sad movement, a very tragic movement, which at its core doesn't have the ability to set itself positive goals. More than they want a state of their own, they want to spit out our state. In the deepest sense of the words, their ethos is a negative ethos. So, yeah. and, and if I may add one word, I think we, are, we, are, we usually are not listening. This is why I'm a great fan of memory.org, um, the Middle Eastern Media Research Institute, who, because it translates Arab newspapers. And if we had been listening, we would have known that the two-state solution was never an option for them because they do not conceive of this um, conflict as a conflict between two national movements. Their, their whole vocabulary comes from the struggle to free Algeria from French. Not Algiers, from not Algiers. El Aqsa. Algiers was another. No, 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 no. Algier. I'm talking about France in Algier. Oh, uh, you say that they see yeah, themselves yeah. as, a, as the, the FLN. Their goal and their model from the very beginning, from the conception of terrorism to then the general strikes to then the appeal to the UN and finally the Intifada. The Intifada is, it was the end of the Algerian, uh, the, the French regime in, in Algeria. So for them, Zionism is a colonial movement. And if we listen not just to asking how much they hate us, which is which is a relevant question, but what is the exact tone and what are they saying? What they're saying is Jews go back to Europe because for them, we are just a branch of the uh, European imperialism. Here. I think you're right, but that's only one aspect to it. And I think that if you if you chalk yeah. this up to a secular terrorist organization, I mean, Arafat met with Ho Chi Minh mm -hmm. in the 1960s. He also absolutely, you know, they had training camps in Algeria. But uh, the thing that I wanted to say was that it is also a jihadist movement. The father of Palestinian nationalism, so-called, was Hajimin al Husseini, and he was a he was a, a jihadist. He viewed himself as a jihadist. He didn't see he wasn't a Palestinian nationalist per se. He didn't want a Palestinian state. He wanted Greater Syria. He wanted. Uh, uh, that greater Syria to encompass the, uh, the Israel, including uh, Judea and Samaria and Gaza, Lebanon, Jordan, and Syria. That's what that's what he wanted, and that was what he 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 talked about. And from the outset, he was also a jihadist. He was the one who formed the first uh, um, international Islamic movement, and he did it in Jaffa in 1930. Um, all of his rhetoric was jihadist when he was. Uh, having when he was collaborating with the Nazis and he was broadcasting messages to the entire uh, Arab world from Berlin uh, throughout the war, he was um, he was extolling ge genocide, but he was talking about eradicating the Jews uh, from uh, in 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 a Quranic uh, way. I mean, he wasn't talking about it as an as being against colonialism. He was talking about it as a Muslim who wanted to blot out. Uh, the Jews who he said were the kids, were the children, were the offspring of pigs and apes. Uh, so so that the, the jihadist aspect of it was all the time when, when Arafat incited the Palestinian terror war in, in 2000, he said millions of, uh, w millions of, uh, sh sh of uh, shahids, of uh, martyrs, of Islamic martyrs are marching on Jerusalem or marching on the Temple Mount. And he his and this was from the very beginning when you know from the outset of the Oslo Accords in 1993 after they were signed in in Washington on the White House lawn he went to uh, he went to Johannesburg and he spoke at a mosque there and there also he said that the Oslo Accords was a lie and it was a and it was a way to advance the jihad so you know the 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 PLO ex, uh, you know expresses itself as a revolutionary anti colonialist terrorist organization when it's speaking to european leftists uh, and american leftists and it and it presents itself as a jihadist movement when it's talking to uh, the muslim world to the palestinians themselves which is, is why you know they they are able to really this which is why they're always making al aqsa the focal point of everything 
Um, so I think that there are both aspects to it. There are terrorist organization that appeals to all, but I think, you know, it's important to, so we talked about how uh, they have incited all of this uh, violence, the Hamas and Fatah together. They've both been involved in all of the violence. The Israeli Arab uh, members of Knesset who have, you know, the joint Arab list uh, has been ir irredentist from the time that the Obama administration essentially uh, put it together before the 2015 elections. And it remains irredentist to this day. And the United Arab list that uh, people like me who wanted to believe something that wasn't true because we wanted it to be true. And I apologize uh, for, for, for having uh, been seduced uh, by uh, by by a desire that unfortunately wasn't borne out in in reality. I don't remember this happening before, and I pledge to ensure that it never happens again. Uh, they too uh, uh, have joined the fray, and um, and this has all the makings for the kind of insurrection that the Palestinians have been pushing for, and they call for intifada of the Arabs of 1948. They're talking about Israeli Arabs rising up against Israel, and this is an existential threat to the state. So uh, it's a very worrisome situation, but I think it's very important. We only have about, oh, I don't know, 15, 20 minutes till we have to end this broadcast today, and I'd like to de devote the rest of our time to really discussing those, you know, the left, the international left, the American uh, left and also the Biden administration and the role that they're uh, playing in what's happening today and for uh, you know pouring pouring uh, kerosene on the flames to ensure that they grow larger as opposed to trying to calm the situation as they pretend they're doing. So um, uh, uh, do you want me to begin or why don't you, you start I'll with say your something, thoughts on the situation? Yeah, I'll, I'll say something very general is that the, the, the Biden administration is hostile to the Abraham Accords because it is uh, friendly towards Iran and it, 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 it operates on the unbelievably detached from reality assumption that they can make Iran a, a cornerstone of order in the Middle East. And so part of their strategy is to downplay or to weaken Saudi, Saudi Arabia and Israel and uh, as a, in paving the way to go back to the Iran deal now and 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 the rest of it. So part of this it would be to resurrect the what I, it's not an original term of mine. What some I don't remember who some intelligent pundit called the priest process industry. They they are going to resurrect the whole thing at, because what what the Trump administration did that was so marvelous was that it just confiscated the veto from the Palestinians uh, be, because the Kerry uh, uh, the Kerry Obama view was that nothing can proceed in the Middle East unless we first solve the, the the Palestinian issue which means they know it's a chronic problem so what this means is preventing the formation of a stronger Israeli Sunni axis that is capable of of blocking Iran's uh, bid for uh, regional hege hegemony. So this is just the, I think, the larger picture. I think you're right. And by the way, um, today I read, uh, just came out today, a very important, very long article in uh, Tablet Magazine, which really is a, a, a generally fantastic magazine that always uh, has material that I find interesting. And sometimes I, have, I find material that I, they have material that I think is essential. And so one piece this of essential- is essential. This is definitely essential. Right. So one, one piece that they put out today was very important, very long, as I said, was written by our colleagues, Michael Duran and Tony Bedron from, uh, from Washington. And they called it the realignment. And basically it's a 360 degree analysis of the Biden administration's policy, which are direct uh, continuation as they show, as they demonstrate in their article of the Obama administration's policies. And the goal of those policies is, was uh, made clear uh, at the time by Robert Malley, who's now in charge of the Iran uh, negotiations and by uh, uh, Barack Obama's deputy national security advisor, Ben Rhodes, was to realign the United States towards Iran and away from its traditional allies in the region, specifically first and foremost, Israel and Saudi Arabia. And, you know, there was some talk at the outset of the Biden administration, well, Tony Blinken and, and Jake Sullivan are supposed to be moderates. And then you have other people led by Robert Malley that are sort of extreme and radicals. But, you know, that that the, because uh, Jake Sullivan and, and uh, Tony Blinken are higher level than uh, 
Malley, who ostensibly reports to 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 Blinken, oh, we don't have anything to worry about because they are the calmer heads and they they will prevail. And they were talking about making a new uh, a nuclear deal with Iran that they said was going to be longer after, and stronger after they go back to the JCPOA. So and this is and Mike Mike Duran and, and Tony Bannon make make a joke. Oh, you read it, so yeah. They're they're going they're they're going to I mean, but our our, our listeners and our viewers may not have I, we I guess we both recommend it heartily because what they're saying is a complete bluff. They're going to surrender the the one leverage the United States has in you know, on Iran, which are the sanction the sanctions, and then they're going to go back to the JCPOA, which ensures Iran a nuclear weapon. This is the meaning of the agreement. It's an international stamp on making Iran a nuclear power by 2030. And they're, they're, they're promoting this bluff that they will have a stronger and longer agreement after Iran gets all its wants. And will not As have, if Iran will ever agree to ever it. They're not, they'll never negotiate anything after that. They, they are getting all they want. It's just, it's mind boggling. But the thing is, and I think that what's important here, and this brings us to what's happening here in Israel today, because I think what's important in, I mean, first of all, their analysis is important. And as they always say, read the whole thing. It's an important thing to read. It's an important, it's an important read. Um, but, um, but, but, but what they're, but what they show is the levels of concealment, is the lengths that uh, Obama went to in his eight years and his people now under Biden are going through uh, in the Biden administration to hide what they're doing. They never ever came clean with the American people and said, look, we want to ditch Israel, we want to ditch Saudi Arabia, we want to ditch Egypt, and we want to join with Iran and also with the Muslim Brotherhood. We, we want to support Hezbollah, we want to support Bashar Assad, and we want to support the Houthis in uh, Yemen who like the Iranians who fund them and arm them and direct them uh, a call for death to America every single day. Um, well, that's what we want. Obama never said that to, to the American people. He never asked for their approval. To, to the contrary, he set up level after level of concealment of, of, uh, of um, uh of lies and mainly of smoke screens where he he hides this uh, policy which is indefensible on any rational level it's defensible ideologically if you're a radical leftist anti-colonialist anti-american and anti-semite then it makes sense under all other circumstances it's delusional so they hit this under layer after layer of lies and of and and i think that that's very important. And that really brings us to, you know, both Obama at the time and now Biden's position on on the Palestinians and what they're doing here and what their role is in the in, in this environment. And here I just I just think it's very important to say what what is the role that the Palestinians and their conflict against Israel, their aggression against Israel, and they're blaming Israel all the time for the aggression that they're actually mounting against Israel, both as a country seeking to demonize it and claim that it is illegitimate and a colonialist state and a racist state and Zionism is Nazism or not Zionism is racism, and their actual physical war against Israel and its people through mob violence, through lynching, through suicide bombings, through missile attacks. Uh, through shooting attacks, through roadside bombs, and everything else that we've experienced, unfortunately, since 1994. Um, so uh, for, for the Obama administration at the time and for the Biden administration, we saw that the Palestinian conflict with them gave them a way to justify their weakening of Israel. And we have to remember where the Obama administration left off, because from the perspective of Joe Biden and his minister and his and his advisors, uh, we are now uh, their administration began with where the world was from America's uh, policy perspective on January 20th, 2017. And what happened and where those, that stood was that the previous month in December when Obama was a lame duck and Trump had already been elected to succeed him, he pushed through in the UN uh, a resolution in the Security Council numbered 2334. And 2334 was, uh, 
was an abomination, as Trump and all of his advisors said repeatedly throughout their four years in office. And the reason it was an abomination, it was anti-Semitic, was that it said that all Israeli presence, including at the Western Wall, by the way, in Jerusalem, in unified Jerusalem, in Judea and Samaria, is illegal. This is, of course, not cr- not correct under international law. And um, and but it is an expression of where they wanted to arrive at. They wanted to delegitimize Israel's existence. They wanted to delegitimize Israel's ability to defend itself against the Palestinians. They wanted to delegitimize Israel's civilian presence in these areas. There are 800,000 Israelis who live in unified Jerusalem and in Judea and Samaria. And essentially, he, each and every one of them, including me and my kids and my husband and our dogs, uh, they're all war criminals because um, being Jewish, breathing in and out while Jewish in the areas that are located beyond Israel's 1949 Armistice lines, which were never a border, were never anything other than ceasefire lines, the end where Israel was able to push back Arab aggression in the War of Liberation in 1948, um, that anything beyond that that is Jewish is illegal, is a is a war crime. And so we we have we have this situation uh, that we're dealing with. And um uh, which is that the Americans are siding completely with the Palestinian narrative. And this has been made very clear over the past weeks since the Palestinian and Arab Israeli violence started really, you know, to go up uh, in uh, in Jerusalem and then in other parts of the country and then from Gaza. Because from the outset, the Biden administration was putting out these statements uh, that were at best equivocating about who was responsible, but really the gist of it and their underlying message was that Israel is responsible for everything that happens, that Jews are being attacked in Jerusalem because Israel is about to throw out a bunch of forlorn Palestinian families from these homes that they've been living in, in ge- for generations. Now, this is this this actually this is the the Biden administration's position. It was made very, very clear. Uh, in a readout of a conversation that National Security Advisor Jake Sullivan had on Sunday evening with it, with his Israeli counterpart, National Security Advisor Mayor Ben Shabbat. They literally said that they didn't want Israel uh, to go forward with any plan to evacuate these Palestinian families. This is an anti-Semitic position, of course, because the claim that the Palestinians should stay in their place is the claim that these buildings that are owned by Israeli Jews uh, it have to be or should be stolen by the Palestinian squatters because Jews should not be allowed as Jews because they're Jews to exercise their property rights in Eastern Jerusalem. So this is there's like saying that Jews as Jews don't have property right or, or that their property rights mustn't be be respected because they're Jews. Well, there's nothing more anti-Semitic than that. I mean, the last time that we had a U.S leaders say something so explicitly anti-Semitic was in 19, it was in 1862, when uh, then Union General Ulysses S. Grant uh, bl- barred Jews from entering the, the territories of Kentucky and Tennessee uh, during the Civil War because they said that they, he said that they were, uh, they were conducting illegal trade uh, with the South. And so, you know, the, these, and that, by the way, his order was uh, overturned by Abraham Lincoln when he found out about it because it was anti-Semitic. Uh, but this is a position now that was that was uh, given to uh, Israel's national security advisor by, by the White House on Sunday evening in the midst of all of this. And I argue, and, and I argued today in my article in, in, uh, in uh, Israel Ayom and also in another article along the same lines that, uh, that I published on Sunday, and both of them uh, are up and they'll be on my website shortly. Um, that these statements by the administration that are placed that are blaming Jews, that are blaming Israeli Jews, in this case property owners in Sheikh Jarrah, and in other cases the Israeli government for uh, premeditated violence that the that the Arabs of Israel, Arabs of Jerusalem, Palestinian Arabs, Arabs of Gaza are carrying out. Uh, in wanton disregard and, in fact, uh, deliberately targeting uh, Jewish civilians simply because they're Jews, that that these statements are fanning the flames, that the escalation that we saw on uh, on Monday evening with the rocket launched against uh, uh, Jerusalem and with the -the round-the-clock bombings of southern Israel with missiles and the lynching of Jews in Ramleh and in the Galilee and in Haifa, and in uh, and and in other mixed cities throughout this country, um, that 
it's hard to see why these would have happened if the United States, as was the practice during the Trump administration, had stood four square behind Israel. That is, by, by siding with the Palestinians and their aggression against Jews, against Israel, the side that's being aggressed against, the Biden administration is giving them a green light to escalate their attacks. This is, and, and you could say you could say something even more general. I think because they're sensing weakness. The, right. The whole, the, you mean the Palestinians the, are the, 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 the Palestinians, the Iranians, the Hamas, the Muslim Brothers. Everyone in the region is sensing weakness again because we're looking at these negotiations for the JCPOA, and we see the Biden administration crawling and we see the Iranians just spitting on their heads they're they're attacking american targets while they're demanding the the uh, cancellation of the sanctions and so everybody in the region and this is a region that that, that is very power oriented everybody senses weakness it's very simple so you're saying that they sense American weakness, and I agree. And I think that they sense that the United States is abandoning Israel, which it is. They're right to think that. And they see that as a green light to attack. And, you know, I mean, I think that this also brings us to what you were talking about with the Palestinian veto. And this is one of the key points and that uh, that Duran and Badran made, which I think it bears repeating. And I think that both of us have also made it ourselves, which is that you know, the, the thing about the, the Abraham Accord is not just that they took the veto away from the Palestinians, it's that they, they, they reflected and then strengthened an alliance that had already been formed in opposition to the Obama administration's realignment of the U.S. alliance system in the Middle East away from Israel and the Arabs and towards Iran, which is that they... Israel and the Arabs began, Israel and the Saudis, the UAE and Bahrain and Egypt began working together against the Muslim Brotherhood and also Iran around about 2013, 2014. So both went after the fall of the Mubarak uh, regime in, in uh, Egypt and its uh, and its uh, and, and the transfer of power uh, to the Muslim Brotherhood, its replacement by the succession by the Muslim Brotherhood. And then in 2013, uh, uh, defense minister and chief of staff of the Israeli, of the Egyptian military, uh, Sisi, uh, overthrew the Muslim Brotherhood regime and, uh, and became the president with the support of Israel, the Saudis, um, the, and the UAE in particular. So that, that event in 2013, in the summer of 2013, really propelled forward this alliance and also Israel's opposition to the Muslim Brotherhood before that. Um, so I think, um, you know, this alliance was formed out of weakness, out of desperation at the fa in the face of the Obama administration. And then the Trump administration, President Trump and his advisors, Jared Kushner, David Friedman, uh, and, and, uh, uh, Jason Greenblatt uh, recognized what had happened, and that was why President Trump made his first foreign trip, first to Saudi Arabia and then directly to to Israel, um, and that was the beginning of this formal alliance that, you know, that was reflected in in the Abraham Accords. The problem is that now that the Biden administration wants to go back to the Obama administration's policies or is reverting to the Obama administration's policies, which, as Duran and, and Badran uh, rightly said, mean the end of a policy of containing Iran in, and in its exchange for a policy of empowering Iran and containing America's allies, harming America's allies, um, that uh, that um, that. They're trying to undermine the Abraham Accords and they're blocking Saudi Israeli or they're working very assiduously to block Saudi Israeli cooperation. And I think that the important right the important insight that they said, and I think we can leave it with that because I chose where we are today and where we could have been and the role that the Biden administration is playing in this, which is that um, a Saudi Israeli peace would have extraordinary strategic implications, not only for ending the Arab conflict with Israel, including the Palestinian conflict with Israel, because it would it would end the rationale of Al-Aqsa is in danger. And you have the head, the most important Muslim country in the world, making peace with the Jews. It would kill the rationale. It would kill the lie that Al-Aqsa is in danger. Uh, but it also would end the rationale for the global jihad, because if the guardians of the two mosques in Mecca and Medina were to make peace with the Jews who are in control of Al-Aqsa, 
then what reason would the Muslims in Pakistan and, and in Malaysia and elsewhere have to be attacking the, the Kufars, the, the, uh, the non-Muslims? What purpose would it serve? So that the, the, anybody who wants peace, anybody who wants to disengage U.S. forces from the Middle East, anyone who wants to end this constant war, would do exactly what President Trump was doing and exactly not what President Obama was doing and what President Biden is now engaged in doing, which is that they would work with U.S. allies to contain and push back Iran and to push forward to cultivate peace between Saudi Arabia and Israel, which was the expected next step after the four peace deals were concluded under the Abraham Accords in the late days of the Trump administration. The Biden administration, through its siding with Hamas, through its siding with the Palestinians, through its embrace of the anti-Semitic narrative that Jews don't have property rights, and, and pushing forward the Palestinian narrative that they are, that Israel is morally uh, unacceptable. You know, it's inherently immoral, much like America that was born in systemic uh, racism and slavery, um, that by pushing forward this narrative and embracing Iran, the United States is blocking peace and is blocking U.S. disengagement from the Middle East because they're, they're ensuring a, a, a future of constant wars that will constantly endanger not only U.S. allies, but U.S strategic interests. So if you wanted to destroy America strategically as a global superpower, you would be doing this. And this is what's happening. Israel is paying a price. And we can only hope that cooler heads will prevail then and that Jerusalem will be able to continue to defy Washington and do what we need to do in order to secure our future and to bring back the peace by beating our enemies. It, I don't see it coming in, in the near future, but 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 it's something we should definitely come back to discussing because we will be discussing this more and more. I'm sure, unfortunately, over the coming months. So yeah. Anyway, stay tuned. Thank you very much for for joining us today, uh, and we will keep you updated uh, about the nature of events here in the Middle East. What's behind it? What is the ice? behind the tip of the iceberg that everybody sees and uh, and how we should move forward in order to solve the problems of this region. So thank you very much for watching us. Share this video with your friends. Make sure that the message gets out. That's why we're doing this. So thank you so much. We appreciate your audience. We appreciate you. And God bless you here from Efrat in Judea and from... And from Tel Aviv. Goodbye. Thank you. Bye-bye.